clinic one transfer uh, Center for Clinical and Translational Research. Um, we're going to get started here in just a few moments. People are still coming in um, on a ra rather regular basis. Um, if you've noticed, like me, that all of the clocks around the campus all tend to vary a little. Um, but this morning we have joining us to speak is Mary Becker who uh, is also with the um, Center for Clinical and Translational Science. And she is going to be speaking to us about recruitment and retention services uh, that are offered uh, through uh, the CCTS. Um, in the past, I've been, um, I've listened to several of their presentations and they have quite a few tools to help us um, as we recruit our subjects into our various studies. It's also very important at this time um, that we be thinking about our recruitment plans as we move forward into this year and into 2022, to be able to be thinking about some of those um, diverse uh, procedures for um, recruiting these diverse uh, populations and then also more importantly how to retain those that we do um, recruit into the studies. So without further ado I present to you Mary Becker. Uh, Mary thank you for joining us today and I will let you take um, the microphone. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you, Karen. I appreciate you inviting me to speak. Um, and hopefully um, I speak well to what you um, have asked me to present here. Um, I am the program manager now for recruitment and retention. Some of you may have um, worked in the past with myself or Tiffany Bernard. Um, Tiffany is now our administrative director. So I have um, transitioned into, um, again, the lead position for recruitment and retention. Um, so I didn't forget, I did put my contact information in the chat box. Um, so for any of you that are interested after hearing this presentation, if you haven't utilized our program um, for recruitment and retention, um, I would invite you to email me. That's probably the best way to contact me currently. Um, we still are doing a hybrid. Um, so we are in the office sometimes um, and then also working from home. Um, and because I knew, moved into a different office here at work, um, my phone is not working yet. So um, again, the best way to contact me is via email um, and it is in the chat box. Um, and I would also suggest that if you are interested in utilizing any of our recruitment methods that you hear about in this presentation, um, we do have a site, it's my CCTS osu.edu where you can actually go in and um, request certain services from um, our program we will get back with you and then typically we'll set up a consultation with you so i just kind of wanted to lay the foundation um, for how folks can contact us here at recruitment and retention and we'll go from there. So hopefully, I'm not even sure how long I have to talk, to be honest, um, but I do this presentation pretty frequently. So um, some of you may be familiar with it um, and we try and add things constantly. So I will just begin um, by talking about a little bit about recruitment itself. We are obviously going to touch on something that a lot of people don't think about, which is the retention portion of these studies. And then we'll talk a little bit about um, each of the different methods that we utilize here in recruitment and retention. And I do want to point out um, that we do work in conjunction with NCH, Nationwide Children's Hospital, to provide some of these um, recruitment methods. So again, as we get into that towards the latter part of this presentation, I will point out which ones are available to those um, at NCH as well, and who you would contact for that information if you would like to move further with that. So um, first screen here, talking about there is a collective recognition that recruitment is a key factor of success for research. So obviously without recruitment, you would have no participants. Without participants, we would have no clinical trials. We would not be able to move forward um, with medicine and prescriptions and anything that you can think of. I have been so surprised by the types of 
clinical trials and research studies that are run here at Ohio State, um, just about anything you can imagine. But again, without participation and without um, individuals um, being recruited for these clinical trials, we would have nothing to move forward with. So next screen, please. So um, just some facts um, that we've got up here. Um, we are talking a little bit about recruitment itself and how it continues to be a problem. Um, obviously, we are employed in recruitment for a reason. Um, it doesn't mean it's smooth sailing all the time. You can see some of these figures up here that 19% of the trials um, were closed or terminated early because they could not accrue enough participants. So data suggests that study timelines have potentially doubled beyond planned enrollment periods due to low recruitment rates. And as much as 86% of clinical trials do not reach recruitment targets within their specified time periods. I can obviously vouch for this and working with PIs and their study teams, we see all of these. Um, and that's why, again, we are here to help. Um, I always suggest when I am doing a consult with PIs and their study teams, that they not look at just one method of recruitment. There are multiple methods. Um, and one of the reasons that we exist in recruitment is to guide you um, in terms of which recruitment method would be the best for what type of um, participants and eligibility criteria you have for your studies. So again, that's something that we would help you with and we'll talk you through in our consultations. But again, having the facts, um, it's kind of sobering to know that 86% of those clinical trials don't even recruit or don't even meet their recruitment targets within their specified time periods. So, um, we do as much as we can to help the study teams to meet those numbers. Next screen, please. So the inability to meet recruitment goals ultimately affects our patients because potential new discoveries are not reaching those who need it most. So perhaps the most important, the inability to meet recruitment and overall study goals, it affects patients by hindering efforts to more effectively diagnose, treat or prevent diseases, despite efforts over multiple decades to systematically describe barriers to identifying and enrolling study participants, recruitment challenges persist. And there is a slew of reasons that these recruitment challenges persist. Um, and we talk a little bit about retention, um, and I'm kind of going to go away from the slides for just a minute. Um, especially in long-term clinical trials, retention is something that's often forgotten when planning. Um, so we try and bring that to the forefront in these um, consultations that we have with our study teams. So there's multiple factors that can play a role in one's decision to drop out, even if it's a short-term study. Um, there is dropout associated with them, and each patient has their own circumstances as to why they have dropped out. We don't always find those reasons, find out those reasons, but we have come to um, some conclusions about those. Um, and it's pretty common in clinical trials. There is a 30% average dropout rate across, across clinical trials. And obviously, like I mentioned before, there are consequences of these dropouts. There's delays, there's missing data. And in the worst case scenario, there's termination of the trial. Um, so there are some reasons for these dropouts occurring. Um, it's possible that the patients have simply changed their mind, um, which they are allowed to do. Um, there's also multiple factors that can play a role um, in one's decision to drop out. And each participant has their own circumstances and motivations for why they got involved in clinical trial in the first place. Um, some of these factors are external, um, but some of these um, recruitment retention dropouts can be prevented. So some of the reasons that we have heard um, back from these study teams, um, from folks that are dropping out, they have inconvenient locations. Um, obviously there's going to be sometimes scheduling conflicts. Um, there's even fi financial constraints on the side of the participants themselves. Um, sometimes they'll feel a lack of appreciation. Um, and sometimes it's as simple as just forgetting visits. 
So um, part of this presentation is about different strategies um, in recruitment. This happens to be strategies, a, a portion of this strategies um, for preventing um, dropout and promoting um, retention. So a few things that you can do. Um, for example, if these folks are saying it's an inconvenient location, I'm, I can't get to it, some things that you consider, that you could consider, would be to get um, or utilize an easier location to get to. You might utilize an outpatient clinic that is close to their um, home or wherever they may be coming from to go to your uh, clinical trial. You might even try um, having them come in for off-peak times. And I know this has changed a little bit because of COVID. A lot of the um, studies that we have seen had moved to in-person or virtual. But again, um, at some point we're going to, and we have started to have people coming back in and just following um, COVID protocol. Um, but off-peak times are something that people can consider um, having your participants come in for. So, um, and also again, conducting those studies at home or via phone when possible. Um, we've talked about financial constraints. Uh, people can't leave their jobs to go participate in a clinical trial. Or we've also heard that the cost of parking at the study site and or travel to the study site is preventing them from continuing with this um, clinical trial. Um, or they might have childcare costs that they have to contend with. So some of the solutions that we offer and suggest to you would, first of all, to consider being flexible with them. Um, some suggestions might be cash compensation or reimbursement rather than a gift card. Um, you could try a different location as well so that they don't have to travel as far and no parking fees associated with your clinical trial. Um, or you can offer different payments, again, that might be um, meeting their needs more than just, like I said, a gift card to Amazon. Um, and when we talk about the location or travel, something that you could suggest or that we would suggest to you would be offering um, bus vouchers or even an Uber voucher or a gift card for Uber to get there. Um, cab vouchers are also possible. So there's a lot of reasons and ways that you can get around um, this uh, loss of participants in your clinical trials. Um, and there's other things that you can do to minimize the burdens to these folks. And again, one of the things that we also suggest and that we've had a lot of questions on is um, what can you do to minimize those burdens um, one of them, again, would be to make them feel appreciated. So um, different things um, make different people feel appreciated. Some people appreciate when you give them swag, like a stress ball, or you might have um, some swag or like um, we have magnets that have been, um, uh, sorry, written on um, or put stickers on that promote participating in research or using research match. Um, so something that they can use. Um, you might have the backpacks that you, you so often see. So people appreciate things like that and to also help get them back and forth to these clinical trials, um, the vouchers or the gift cards for the Ubers, things like that are also helpful and um, they also appreciate um, being notified that they may be um, having an appointment coming up. So whether you notify them by text or you can use email, postcards, which we could help you design. There are different methods that people use. Um, but like I said, we really, really would um, suggest that you think about these um, retention um, I'm sorry, I can't even think of the word, the retention um, techniques as you are thinking about your recruitment as well. They kind of go hand in hand. So again, we can touch on this later if anybody has any other questions or wants some, some other suggestions specifically for problems that you may have seen. Um, I'd be happy to discuss those um, in this environment or again, we can set up something and have a consultation one-on-one -on -one to talk about it. So if you would please advance the slide, we can continue on. 
So a little bit about um, when you think about recruitment, you must think about participants. So obviously that is something that's really important. You have to think about who you're talking to, who you're trying to recruit. You need to know your audience. One of the ways that you can do that is by thinking outside of the box in terms of who deals with this demographic. Um, and one of the methods, the recruitment methods that we talk about using these demographics for is Facebook advertising. So you have to know if you're recruiting a particular age group and where can you reach that particular age group. So for example, the 14 to I believe it's 32 age group, they're often found on Twitter, um, Snapchat, um, and YouTube. We're starting to do YouTube videos and banners to attract people um, to your clinical trials and studies um, and Facebook advertising. So it's an older demographic, but again, you need to know who your audience is. And then again, we can help you design your recruitment plan towards those audiences and target them. Um, and you'll also target them by um, areas that they are involved in. So for example, if you have a diabetes study, um, we might target um, a diabetic um, support group in Facebook. So there are different methods that we can use based on what your eligibility criteria is, um, the age demographic that you're looking for, um, even ethnic categories, we can do all these. Um, and there are different recruitment methods that we'll talk about later on in this, this um, presentation here. Next slide, please. So there are different reasons um, why folks choose to participate in research, um, and they're all personal reasons. So some people will par participate so that they have access to a life-saving or changing medication or treatment. Um, some do it because they know somebody who was sick, um, and some do it because of the benefits that participating in research gives them. So what's important to us is that we think of all of these reasons when we're designing our recruitment strategies because different strategies will appeal to different people. Next slide. So a study should be designed incorporating the participant's perspective to help anticipate enrollment and realistically reach the available population. Um, so dozens of patients can be screened, but if they're not eligible or they lose interest in a study, it's back to square one. So a protocol should be designed incorporating the patient's perspective to help anticipate enrollment and realistically reach the available population. So sometimes you might not get it right the first time, but we can go back and we can revamp and talk about things and use different criteria, um, different recruitment methods. Um, obviously all these different methods need to be IRB approved and we can discuss that um, further into this presentation, but um, it's not a one and done in terms of recruitment, as long as you have planned accordingly. Um, so again, we try and talk to you, get information from you from the get go um, in terms of planning who your audience is going to be and how we're going to target them. Next screen, please. So recruitment materials often don't reflect the motivation of participants. Um, they need to reflect the intent of the study, presenting it in an easy to understand and honest way. Um, and there are different things that are involved in this. So when creating your recruitment materials, it's important to think about um, health literacy levels, since only 12% of US adults had proficient health literacy. And it's important to utilize plain language as much as, much as possible so that the potential participants can understand your study. And I'm gonna kind of go off the path a little bit just to talk about both of these, health literacy and plain language. Um, I did do a presentation not too long ago about both of those topics. Um, health literacy and plain language, if you don't understand what someone is telling you, you are not going to be able to be an advocate for yourself. Um, plain language is what this is all about. So when we talk to you, and for example, if you're using one of our methods called study search, we review these for plain language. Um, so most people, we try and focus on a six to eighth grade reading level. Um, there are methods out there 
um, and resources out there where you can put your language into the resource and it will give you um, a, a level, an education level where it is at. Um, and that's how you direct your, your writing. So we might change some words. I always joke and say that thesaurus is our best friend. Um, so we try and write in plain language so that the majority of the people are able to understand what we're saying. And that doesn't just go for clinical trials. That goes in medicine as well. Even when you're doing consenting, um, we talk about using plain language. Um, you're reaching the most number of people this way. Um, so you want, again, the most number of people to be able to understand what it is that you're saying using those simple words. And again, there are a multitude of resources out there. Um, and I can share those with you. Again, if you want to contact me, I would even be happy to share the slide deck from that presentation. There are resources in there um, that talk about different words to use and different resources that you can go to for medical terminology. So. Um, next screen, please. So again, a little bit about what plain language is. It's a strategy for making written and oral information easier to understand, and it's one important tool for improving health literacy. So they go hand in hand. Plain language is communication that users can understand the first time they read it or hear it. So with reasonable time and effort, um, a plain language document is one in which people can find what they need, they can understand what they find, and then they can act appropriately on that understanding. Thanks, Brett. I see your, your um, comment there. The IRB requires an eighth grade reading level. So it's good to know a lot of people don't even understand what that entails. And again, um, in these resources that we have available, um, it will share with you um, again, what reading level your writing is at, and then you can adjust accordingly. Next slide, please. So some key elements of plain language. We've got organizing information so that the most important comes first. Um, pretty self-explanatory there. Breaking complex information into understandable chunks. So we don't want the run-on sentences, obviously. Um, we don't want big, long paragraphs of information. That's where you start to lose people. Um, using simple language and defining technical terms. That again refers back to the resources that I talked about that are available to you, um, where you can use a simpler word that means the same thing that becomes more understandable for those that are reading it. And also using the active voice. So saying things that are current rather than past tense. So there's a lot of resources that are available for plain language training, such as PRISM. And there's a plain language medical dictionary that's made available from the University of Michigan that is really key and is very easy to use as well. Next slide, please. So a little bit about advertising mediums. Um, one part of recruitment is creating awareness of your study. So when planning a recruitment campaign, it's critical to know what media is at your disposal and how to leverage those outlets to fit your recruitment goals. So some of our most recommended mediums are digital strategies from ads in newsletters and social media. Um, again, I'll talk a little bit about this, um, but I will say that social media um, has probably taken over in terms of the recruitment method that people most often request from the recruitment and retention program here at the CCTS. And we'll get into that a little bit more um, in just a little bit. Um, we do have some study teams that utilize radio ads that are not handled through our office. I just wanna make sure that, that that's clear. Um, so although they do have a lower out-of-pocket expense than like television ads, um, they may not be as engaging. Um, and since radio is seen as background medium and not something people focus on, um, but those are options that you can explore. And that's always important to have options when you're doing this. And that's again, why we recommend using multiple methods of recruitment. Next slide, please. 
Um, so here are some examples. Um, I think that when information about a study appears in the news, there's a huge interest in it. We start to get a lot of calls because people have seen it, whether it's online um, or it's in paper form. Um, so sometimes colleges even will do a blog post on your study, um, and that's perfectly fine. But when this happens, it's critical that the blog doesn't sound like a recruitment advertisement unless it has been IRB approved. So just kind of keep that in mind. Um, and again, we can always give you suggestions if you're interested in doing something in print. Um, we do have contacts um, and resources that we can share information with you to make that possible as well. Sometimes we're not always the one that is doing the actual um, um, recruitment, I guess, the methods of it, but we can share who you should go to for those and for that information. Next slide. So a little bit about digital recruitment. Um, so there are some strengths and weaknesses associated with digital recruitment. It's definitely emerging as a useful tool um, in terms of recruitment, and it can be useful because it allows for targeting and reaching out to a diverse audience, um, which is what we are we are focusing on now. Um, some of the strengths of the digital recruitment are that it has and it comes with a lower cost. It's also trackable. One of the things that we do in terms of our Facebook advertising is um, once your ad has completed running, we do within 24 to 48 hours um, provide you with some um, uh, performance metrics for how your ad did. Um, that can give you some feedback um, on what works, what doesn't, and also if you would like to continue. So for Facebook ads, if your ad, one, debt, one ad did very well and another image with the ad, not so much, um, you may choose to run the ad again um, using just the one image. So it, again, it gives you some metrics to go off of and we love hearing feedback once people have run ads um, to see how successful it's been for you. Um, there are obviously numerous advanced targeting options within um, Facebook. We do explain this for the novice user. So when we have a consultation and we do have um, an intake request form that we use, if you're interested in using Facebook advertising for your study, um, we will explain how this works um, as we go through that consultation and then we do a mock-up ad for you. So um, some of the weaknesses associated with digital recruitment, there is a slow buildup of reach. So who it goes out to, we are targeting people, but it does take a little bit of time. Um, for those of you that may be interested, um, an average run for a Facebook ad, most people are starting to do two weeks for $200. Um, and there is a lot of competition for these audiences attention, obviously, because there are a lot of digital recruitment methods out there. Currently, we have only been promoting Facebook advertising, um, but with Facebook, along with it goes the WhatsApp, as well as Instagram. So depending on your targeting, it will your ad will show up on one of those platforms. Um, we are now looking into doing YouTube advertising with banners. Um, and Twitter as well. So again, this is where we come in and we would recommend things to you based on um, your criteria and who you are looking to attract to your, um, to your study. Next screen, please. So some of the common methods on OSU campus, um, there is on campus today. Um, it is an emailed newsletter. We definitely have people that utilize that. We do see some of the ads and the study teams that we are working with um, having information on their studies be posted in on campus. I think it's an awesome idea. Again, it's just another method for um, recruitment. Um, bus advertising, um, that is it's definitely asked about. I'm not really sure, to be honest, how many people end up pursuing it. If you are interested, please contact me. We do have some contacts um, uh, with CABS, and so um, we would refer you to them um, where they can discuss the monetary um, information that goes along with that. Um, the CCTS will design flyers for you if you're interested. Um, we do not print those flyers for you. That would be on you. I do suggest um, 
using someone here on campus if you're interested in printing those off. Um, and something that we uh, just got involved with is um, the student organization here on campus that will actually allow you to bring a flyer to them that we have um, designed for you. And they will put them in all of the residence halls. They will actually post them on every floor of the residence halls for you. So again, if your um, study happens to be um, oh, there you go. The Clinical Research Center offers printing services. Thank you, Kristen. Um, if you are interested and your study is looking to attract the student age population here at Ohio State, please let us know. Like I said, we can put you um, in touch with um, some folks from the Office of Student Life, um, and they have some resources that can help you with that. One of the other options that we have here at the CCTS is something called Study Search. Um, study search is something that will post. Um, you can actually post your studies here um, online. Um, it is provided to OSU as well as NCH um, PIs. You can use it as long as you have an IRB approved study. Um, and it is um, a self serve um, option. So you actually go in and enter your study on study search yourself, you submit it. It comes to us, and this is where we would review it for plain language um, and best practices. And once we do that, we send it back to you for your approval. Um, if you are fine with everything that's on there, then we can actually go ahead and we can make that public facing right then. So within about 24 hours, sometimes less, sometimes a little bit more, um, we can go ahead and have your study posted to the public and they can see contact information out there as well as a brief purpose and eligibility criteria. Um, we do get a lot of calls from people that have been online and see it, see your study out on study search, but they don't remember the name of it. So all they have to do is contact us here at the CCTS on our hero line. Um, as long as they know what the study is in relation to, we can go ahead and we can find the information for them and we share the study coordinator or the contact's name um, and contact information with them. Um, we've talked a lot about Facebook advertising. Um, that is, again, probably our biggest uh, recruitment tool right now that people are requesting to use. And obviously there is word of mouth. Um, so that always helps us um, here at the CCTS just to know what we're all about as well as different studies. Next slide, please. Sorry, let me catch up with you. So the recruitment services offered by the Center for Clinical and Translational Science. So this is where we're actually going to talk a little bit about the recruitment methods that are available here for you to request to use. Um, so a great place to, um, I'm sorry, next slide. A great place to start working on your project um, is through the CCTS website where we have several cores that are available to assist you. So you can go to ccts.osu.edu and kind of work your way through our website. Obviously you see here recruitment and retention, um, but today I am talking to you about recruitment and retention, but it's just one of the several programs that you should consider talking to when developing your protocol. Um, if you're not sure who to talk to, you can always start with recruitment and then we can refer you. Um, I will tell you, we do have a lot of questions about regulatory issues and IRB. Um, oftentimes when people are recruiting, we'll refer back and forth with community engagement and Nationwide Children's Hospital is also another one that we have started referring people to, they have something um, called the in Integrating Special Population Program. Um, so if you are recruiting for um, a special population, whether it be the um, uh, elderly population, there may be a specific population like Alzheimer's that you're looking to recruit for um, small children, um, obviously Nationwide Children's Hospital, um, they have and I'm gonna say experts that will help you think of ways, um, different methods and resources for recruiting them that even we in recruitment and retention don't necessarily think about all the time. So I will do referrals um, to Smitha at Nationwide Children's Hospital, and then she determines who the best person for you to talk to there would be. And oftentimes recruitment and retention will also be in on that call um, and we can share these ideas. Next screen, please. 
So we talk about recruitment and retention services, helping to design those first, first touch points within the community and share best practices. Um, so requesting a consultation with recruitment and retention services early in the design of a research study can help to reduce the burden of study participant recruitment. And it can also help um, when those challenges um, arise and you're not sure what to do at that point. Next slide, please. So I've mentioned the consults that we have, um, and those are help set up to help with the, um, the research teams with best practices, design of marketing materials like the flyers or the posters or the postcards. I will say we haven't had a lot of call for those since COVID began. I know they took a lot of the lit racks out of the offices and the clinics. Um, so people have kind of steered away from those. Um, and gone for different methods. That doesn't mean that we don't do them anymore though. So if that's something that you're interested in using either now or down the road, please let us know. Um, my chart for recruitment is something that had been worked on for a long time. Um, we are now using it. Um, there is a charge for my chart for recruitment because we work with um, the information warehouse and honest brokers to build um, queries. So there is a charge for that. Um, however, um, there are vouchers that are available through the CCTS to help offset that charge. So if you are interested in using my chart for recruitment, please inquire about the voucher program as well. Um, Sean Collins here in the CCTS is in charge of that, um, and I can make an introduction to you um, or for you to him, um, and he will help walk you that, through that process. Then my chart for recruitment obviously, obviously uses my chart um, to recruit people that may be eligible for your studies. Um, and again, we have a process map that has been designed to help explain and make the process a little bit easier for PIs and their study search teams to know what the next steps are when you're using my chart for recruitment. Um, but you would start the process by um, coming to us here in recruitment. You can enter it in my CCTS and it will come to us that way. You can send us an email um, to myself right now and um, we can start you on the path and decide whether or not that is actually a viable option for you. Um, the estimated fee, it does vary um, for my chart. Um, that can be determined once you are approved to use my chart for recruitment and you begin working with information warehouse, they can give you a better idea of how much the cost is going to be. Um, but I will tell you most of the time that voucher that can be up to $3,000, most of the time it takes that amount. Um, so that would probably be your low end. But honestly, we don't get a lot of feedback after that point. Um, so Sean might be able to tell you a little bit more about that. Um, turnaround time for my chart for recruitment. It depends, again, how big your query is um, and what they are searching for. It is definitely a process. It's something that's literally probably going to take weeks. So, but again, multiple methods can be worked on um, at the same time. So don't think that just because you're using my chart for recruitment that you can't start using research match or study search or some other um, method of recruitment at the same time. Um, and they're, they're actually used for different purposes. And just to qualify this, my chart for recruitment is typically not used to recruit healthy participants, although I did recently have a PI say, let's get creative with it. Um, and even though she was looking for healthy participants, there are ways to say, well, this person just had a baby and having a baby is considered a condition. So again, don't, don't cross it off um, as not being something that might be viable for you to use. I would, I would definitely recommend that you ask about it if you're interested and we can evaluate it. Um, again, we do offer referrals um, to, like I said, NCH for sure, um, and other programs within the CCTS. Um, and even outside of the CCTS, there are things that we don't have access to, but we know who can help you. Um, so we are creating a toolkit. So when that is completed, um, that toolkit will also be a referral or slash resource for you to go to. Um, research match. 
Um, I'm not going to talk about all of these because I'm going to talk about each one, but Research Match, Study Search, and our other resources we'll get to in just a second. So, Rachel, if you want to advance the slide, <clears throat> we'll talk a little bit about best practices, though. Um, so providing best practices for providing great customer service, which is something else that the recruitment and retention program can do. So we suggest um, PI thank you letters that can be sent out to participants after they have been um, part of your clinical trial or your research study. There is a participant satisfaction survey um, so that you can get feedback on your clinical trial and how it was to actually participate in your trial. Um, we have done role playing recently where we got together with some of the study teams. Um, it was a collaboration between Ohio State and Washington University. We did some role playing because they were going to be contacting and possibly consenting folks over the phone and they weren't comfortable with it. So we acted as the participant or the possible participant. Um, and we would throw things in there, just kind of little monkey wrenches sometimes to see how they were going to respond to these questions. Um, and both sides felt that it was very valuable. So if that's something that your study team might need some help with, we'd be happy to um, put something together. Um, and there's also customer service training, which kind of goes hand in hand with the role playing. Um, you might have pushback from some people. Um, and so providing customer service training on how to deal with um, issues that arise with your participants um, and to kind of smooth things over, um, we give suggestions on what you can do. So if, again, you're interested in learning more about that, please contact us. So again, participants stay in a study more often because of loyalty to the team or a member of the team rather than to the study. So if you establish a relationship with members of that study team and your participants, they are more likely to be retained within your clinical trial. Next slide, please. Marketing materials and social media. So we can assist in designing marketing materials like double-sided postcards um, that can be more effective than posters. Um, they're great to leave a stack out in places like the um, clinics when we're able to do so again, so that potential participants can pick one up and take it with them rather than kind of standing there and trying to read it when there are other folks around. Um, and we've provided some examples of postcards that we assisted in designing. So uh, these are actually some of the postcards that we have designed in the past. Um, again, we will work with you to design it to design these. Um, and they can be double sided as well. So there's actually a lot of uh, quite a lot of information that can be included on those. Um, and you can even provide links on these too. if you have put your study out on study search, you can provide a link to them as well on there. So there are multiple ways that they can learn more about your studies. Um, also for any study that's published on study search. Um, we're able to do social media posts and direct viewers to the study search page for more information. Um, so the last example um, that we had where they did that, they reached over 1,800 people um, with that link. So we encourage study teams to share the post also so that you can increase your reach. So this method doesn't require additional IRB approval and there's no cost for simply posting them. Next slide, please. So in talking about paid social media, um, we do have an intake form. Again, it's a red cap survey. We get a little bit of information about your study, what your estimated budget is. We will do a mock-up for you. Um, this is a huge strategy now that we're using. The CCTS Facebook page will work with your team to develop the ad and we'll host the ad on the CCTS page once it's been IRB approved. Um, so as part of the ad, you'll choose a target audience, a total budget that you set, and the duration that you want your ad to run for. Um, we do not charge for doing the mock-ups. We don't charge for getting the images either. We have a subscription to a stock photo um, supplier, and we can pick images that go with what your study is about. And we run those by you. So if you don't like them, we're happy to go back and find some more images. One point that I will say about this right now, um, the Wexner Medical Center, 
um, is advising us that in any image that we use that shows individuals, that those individuals are wearing masks. So we are trying to be um, compliant with what's going on as far as COVID goes. So we do and we are able to get images that have individuals wearing masks. Um, and we have not, we've only had one comment um, and, and I would say it was a snarky comment that somebody put on the Facebook ad. And when we see things like that, we do share comments with the PIs so that um, we can actually respond back to those comments. So some people don't understand how to learn more about their studies that, are, that they're looking at on Facebook advertising. We will answer those for you. Um, but there, if there are negative comments, we do actually hide the comments. So. Um, we can also determine the characteristics of your audience. So depending on the social media characteristics, of the potential participants, um, and then Facebook will attempt to display that post on the Facebook and Instagram news feeds of those that fit the demographics selected, like age, location, interest, behaviors, et cetera. Um, and neither the study team nor the CCTS staff members are aware whose Facebook or Instagram news feeds this ad will appear on. So users who are being shown the ad aren't identified to those using this method. Only if the potential participant who sees the ad decides to follow up with the study team, will you know who the person is that saw the post. Next screen. This is a little bit again about my chart for recruitment. Um, so we're looking for eligible volunteers who are identified via the query using research informatics services. You'll also be working with an honest broker who sends the recruitment request um, and it pushes out that study description um, on some boilerplate language that we will help um, you um, design and it does have to be IRB approved. So again, there is a process to go through. We can't really say how long it takes. It also depends on how quickly the IRB is approving things. So next slide, please. The next thing that I wanted to mention is something called our hero helpline. Um, you see a phone number up there as well as um, an email address. We have received actually over 3,200 calls. Um, we get about 25 calls a month, calls or emails, I should say. And these, again, are people that have seen studies out there. They read about it. They heard about it um, in various ways, uh, they, you know, word of mouth. They actually, we actually had somebody that saw an ad that ran during um, one of the football games. And they called us um, because it was about a study that was being done here. And to me, this is like the funnest part of my job to answer these questions because it's a wild goose chase because sometimes they'll say, well, the person in the ad had red hair or something like that. And they were talking about, I'm not sure if it was epilepsy or, and it's, it's a wild goose chase, but when you actually find the study that they're referring to, they are so thankful um, because sometimes we literally are their last resort or they have talked to so many people and gotten nowhere. And we actually do spend time researching whether it's a study here or um, we even get calls for Oklahoma State University because they've seen OSU advertised and they think it's one of our studies. So it's a lot to work through, but it's really rewarding. Um, and so, like I said, this is, this is just another method for people to learn more about um, how to learn about their resources for signing up for studies and clinical trials, as well as finding things that they've already heard about. Next slide, please. Um, research match is another method that's probably second in line now. Ohio um, actually leads the number of volunteers for research studies. We have over 17,000 volunteers um, in the state of Ohio for research match. That is by far the most number of volunteers. Um, we do advertise using Facebook, <clears throat> excuse me, to sign up for research match as well as study search, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, we do ask that if you're interested in using it, um, we will help you draft a research message that has to be IRB approved. Um, we work within all types of demographics, um, with all types of diseases, looking for all types of studies and participants. Um, so 
Again, you do have to have IRB approval to access Research Match. We will do a training for you and help you build your first search so that then you can send it out to um, possible participants that are eligible for your study. There's also a feature within Research Match where you can do a feasibility search based on your eligibility criteria, and you can actually see a good idea or get a good idea of how many participants there are already registered in Research Match that match your eligibility criteria, and if they are interested, may be able to join. So this is a really good um method for recruiting i will say the studies that um use research match have to have a health related outcome though so most of the people that come to us wanting to use research match that's already the case once in a while we do have to kind of turn them away um, because it's not health related or has a health outcome but in that case obviously there are other methods that we can suggest to them so they're not going to walk away and empty-handed without some form of recruitment um, a recruitment method i should say next screen um, study search, it's our homegrown. Um, I talked a little bit about this. You can see the recently posted studies over on the side. So if you do post your study on study search, um, as soon as we make it available to the public, the most recent ones will um, appear over on the right hand side. They can use keywords to search um, as well as searching by categories. This is updated constantly with new studies. So in the last year, we've had over 36,000 hits on this website. Um, again, this is something that is offered to OSU and NCH um, PIs and study teams to use. And if your study goes on for quite a while um, and it's not appearing in the recently posted studies column, um, what we can do for you is we can go in, we can unpublish it and immediately republish your study and it will pop up again to the recently published posted studies column, and hopefully um, that will get it some fresh looks. So there's some ways that we can play with re these recruitment methods um, to continue them along. Next screen, please. Um, this is just a sheet that we pass out sometimes to show you the difference between the different participant recruitment strategies. Study search and research match are very similar. Um, research match does require that you have IRB approval. Study search only requires that your IRB that your study is IRB approved. Um, and study search is, like I said, something that can be done immediately. So they're very easy to use. You can click on those links um, and I can send this uh, slide deck out if you're interested. Um, but again, these are all things that you can also request via my CCTS, which is our database tracking system for any program um, that you are interested in utilizing. Next screen. We talked about resources, connecting with various resources um on campus um like i said if i don't know the answer we don't know the answer to the question that you're asking my motto is always i don't know but i will find out for you so i am not going to leave you hanging um, i will go until i find the answer so please don't hesitate if you have a question a recruitment question um, about how to do something or who can help you with this i would be happy to either find the answer for you or i can refer you to them if you'd like to talk to them yourself next screen um, we do have several strategies also to increase awareness of participating in research on campus. We've worked very hard to gain a presence and be recognized. So obviously we can be found on study search, research match, the Wexner website, my chart, we have postcards, Facebook page, Twitter, and we often attend um, events in the community. So we have gone to the African American Male Wellness Initiative. Um, we have been at the Healthy Communities. Um, over on the east side of Columbus, as well as when they did it over at the Jamison Crane. They did not do that this year. Um, and coming in the spring, we are going to have something called Participate in Research Awareness Week, um, where we will be at different sites on campus just promoting participation in research. Um, we'll have flyers, we'll have swag. So we're trying to attract anybody and anyone. So it, whether it's people that are visiting um, at the medical center, we're also trying now to boost our reach into the students and find different ways to reach students for clinical trials 
contact me if you're interested in that. I'm so excited to share our new resources that we have. I think you will like it and be appreciative. I think it will really help people. Next screen. We're almost done, I promise. Um, recruitment Cafe is coming up. There are a series of discussions designed to help you with your recruitment and retention challenges. Um, we were running them once every other month. Um, our next one will be in the month of December. Um, we are actually going to be spotlighting the Integrating Special Population um, program through NCH. Um, so please join us for that. And that is just a discussion, an open discussion of questions. Um, and sharing knowledge. And the last screen, which is our site and submit screen. Um, if you do use our services, we do ask that you um, site and submit the CCTS. Here is our information. And real quickly, I'm sorry that I went so long. Um, I have about two minutes to answer any questions. Um, and if not, we have the chat box and I can get back to you. Karen, do you want to shout things out? Yeah, well, actually, I think we've answered most of the questions along the awesome. way. Yep. Um, I did want to also add that in December, when you have your um, cafe, we are also our um, presentation for the month will be Dr. Uh, Cynthia Gerhardt, who oversees the special populations at Nationwide Children's. And so she is also going to be speaking for us. So um, I think that we'll be covering that topic well for the month of December, um, in recruiting our special populations. Um, is an important aspect of recruitment um, for recruiting diverse populations. Um, Dr. Bushman asked if we would be sending out the slide deck. Yes, that is our typical way of doing it is to send the slide decks um, a copy of today's um, presentation will also be um, uploaded onto the CCTS website into our um, library. Um, if there are any questions, uh, as Mary said, please reach out to us. You can reach out to either me, or Rachel, or Mary, or anyone at the CCTS, and we will find an answer for you. Uh, it may take us a little bit, but um, we will find answers. Um, that is what we are here for, is to help you uh, with the conduction of your study trials. Um, thank you so much, Mary. Every yes, time I welcome. listen to you, I hear new things. Me too. Um, I learn new things every day. I, this job has taken me so long to learn and I'm so excited. Um, so please, like I said, if you have any questions at all about recruitment, retention, or any of our methods, I would be happy to do a one-on-one -on -one with anyone here. Um, again, my information is in the chat as well. So my contact information. Yes. And I can also let you all know uh, that there are other uh, CC CTSA hubs around the nation that do reach out to our recruitment team um, yes. and ask for assistance and presentations as well. So um, they are most definitely um, on the A1 list. So again, if you have those recruitment needs, don't reinvent the wheel. Contact Mary and her yeah. team and uh, they can help talk it out for you. Exactly. So if we don't have any other questions, mm -hmm. I thank you all for um, coming today. Uh, again, if you have questions, feel free to send them to us. Um, otherwise, Rachel will be sending out the evaluations uh, and also um, the certificates uh, later on. So enjoy your day. It looks to be another nice one. And we'll talk to you all later. Thank you. Thanks, Karen. Thanks, Rachel.